Let's cut the Earth in half. You can see all of its layers. Here's the inner core. It's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven. That's the mantle, an ocean of hot lava. Here comes the crust of the Earth, the solid surface on which our civilization lives. But if you look up, there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here, which protects our planet from radiation. And nope, it's not the Earth's magnetic field. This bubble is made of radio waves. Our planet grows like a Christmas tree in the radio spectrum. But we're interested in low-frequency waves, the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines. So, radio waves are like light waves, or regular ocean waves. Look at this one. The distance between the two peaks is the wavelength, and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency. For example, there are 10 waves in this interval of one second. So, can you guess the frequency of this wave? Yep, it's 10 hertz. Cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 megahertz. So, add six more zeros to that number. But waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well. Think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel. That's because there is metal inside. It's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot. Salt water is also a kind of conductor. So, if the submarine is deep enough, the thick layer of water weakens the signal and we lose communication. To maintain it, we send fewer waves but make them longer. In the same amount of time, the frequency of the short waves will be much higher than the frequency of the long waves. That's why they're called very low frequency waves. But as it turns out, these waves travel all over the Earth and even into space. This is where things get interesting. The waves collide with particles of radiation from the sun. We think of the sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat but it actually emits a lot of harmful radiation. Each flare, or the electrical discharge of material on our home star, causes an even greater burst of radiation. These particles fly to our planet, just as radio waves do. They travel 93 million miles from the sun to Earth in eight minutes and crash into our bubble, which acts as a shield. Basically, radiation particles from the sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the Earth. Our planet's magnetic field traps them, and a recently discovered bubble of very low-frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt. It helps us repel some of the harmful emissions. Analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to Earth. But when our civilization began to use radio actively, our waves raised that belt higher. No one expected such an effect from simple radio waves, but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future. When you're on Earth, its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet glow. This is an aurora. Next time you admire this beauty, know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays. But if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, somewhere in space, I have bad news for you. Nothing protects you there. This is a big problem for astronauts, who spend months on the International Space Station. Perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low-frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft. The same is true for other planets. We're probably going to colonize Mars. There is no magnetic field there, and nothing can protect you from radiation. But if you create an artificial bubble there, you can reduce the harmful radiation. Another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere. It's like a layer cake or an onion. Each level of the atmosphere has its own properties. The lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere. This layer contains 80% of the weight of all the air on the planet. It's also the main place where water vapor lives. And this is where the machine called weather works. The sun sends rays of energy to the Earth. Our planet's surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere. This makes it move and change places with the cold air. So all the wind, cyclones, storms, and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere, up to about 7.5 miles high. That's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles. The wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area, and the air here is not as dense as it is down on Earth. Flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit. It's hard, but at a 6-mile altitude, flying feels like moving through light whipped cream. The plane almost feels no resistance, so it's a win-win. They save fuel and keep the passengers safe. 
A couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold, and you can't breathe there. It's cold because there are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other. You wouldn't be able to breathe here for the same reason. That's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks, just in case. Let's go a little here. This is the stratosphere. There's even fewer air molecules up here, and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather. This part of the atmosphere also contains the well-known ozone layer. This is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone is almost the same as oxygen, except it has three atoms in it. When harmful ultraviolet rays enter our atmosphere, they crash into the O3 molecule. The ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom. The ray itself is converted into heat, but the ozone regenerates quickly. A single oxygen atom joins the O2, and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again. It's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation. It gave birth to all life on Earth. As our civilization developed, we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere. We used to fill our old refrigerators with it. A single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air, and then it would bind a single oxygen atom. Now, the ozone can't regenerate like it used to. Fortunately, we banned the use of such harmful gases and the ozone layer began to regenerate. Scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century. The stratosphere ends at about 31 miles. The next layer is the mesosphere, the coldest of them all. On average, it's about negative 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times colder than your freezer. This is the layer of the atmosphere where incoming meteors start to ignite because of friction in the air. Then they will eventually burn up completely. The air here is too thin for airplanes or balloons to fly, but it's still too dense for satellites. So, this layer of the atmosphere is not well studied. The next layer extends from 55 miles above sea level to about 500. That's a little more than the distance between Las Vegas and San Francisco. Carmen Line is situated in this layer of the atmosphere. This is the boundary between our planet and space. The thermosphere is where all our spacecraft and satellites fly. It's also home to the International Space Station. The temperature rises extremely. The air here is about 10 times hotter than your oven can produce. It's all due to solar activity. But you would never be able to feel this heat. The air molecules that carry the heat here are so small that you would literally float between them. Imagine a giant pool with only three drops of water. That's the thermosphere. And the highest layer of our atmosphere is the exosphere. This is the widest layer of our air bubble. Scientists believe its boundaries are about halfway to the moon at 120,000 miles. This is the point where the pressure of solar radiation begins to exceed the Earth's gravity. It's still part of our atmosphere. This means that astronauts who went on various space missions and have been on the ISS have actually never left the Earth's atmosphere. Have you ever thought about Earth itself as an intelligent, well, not creature, but maybe an entity? Like it has a mind and some survival instincts of its own. When said like this, it sounds like you're about to watch a fantasy movie where the planet we walk and live our daily lives on will suddenly wake up, realize it doesn't like us that much after all, and just go crazy. Hope not. But we're not actually talking about such scenarios more of the idea that the collective activity of life, like microbes and plants, can change a planet and give it a life of its own. It's like the planet has a green mind. The metaphor of Earth as a living planet makes sense. Creatures across the globe crawl, swim, walk, and fly through the uppermost layers of our land, ocean, and sky. Plants cover much of our world. Plus, there are viruses and bacteria in the water, soil, and even atmosphere. Now imagine all the living things on Earth, like plants, animals, and microbes, as a giant team working together. They have different jobs, but they all do their thing to make the planet a better place to live. For example, plants make oxygen that we breathe, and animals help pollinate flowers. Together, they form the biosphere which is like the Earth's team of life. 
That's where the idea of planetary intelligence comes in. Just like individuals and groups can be intelligent, so can an entire planet. Researchers believe we should measure the planet's intelligence by its ability to keep itself going forever. And just like how humans need to work together to survive, a planet's collective intelligence is measured by the capacity of all the life on it to work together towards this same goal. It's like the planet is a complex system that knows how to take care of itself. Like forests, they can share nutrients through their secret underground networks of fungi. This helps all the trees stay healthy. We can obviously learn a lot from forests. If we jump into the fantasy universe while looking for intelligent, conscious planets, we definitely choose Mogo from Green Lantern. It's a specific planetary entity that can do things like changing its weather and altering gravity, plant growth, or some other surface conditions. Or how about the stunning Pandora from Avatar? Do you remember the fascinating scenes of flora and fauna there with organs that might remind you of tentacles? They enable creatures to interlink with each other on a neural level. It's like the entire planet is like one giant brain with many smaller trees, creatures, and its other pieces as its cells. We're far from that, but it's still nice to imagine. At the moment, our civilization is in the stage scientists named an immature technosphere. That means we're still too focused on using technology that doesn't always do good for our planet. We don't have a planetary intelligence or a collective understanding of what needs to be done to do better for our planet. Instead, we're all just doing our own thing. I mean, we're not at the worst stage. Researchers have come up with four stages of Earth's past and future to explain how planetary intelligence could impact the long-term future of humanity. The first stage is what we call the immature biosphere. It's when life first started on Earth, billions of years ago. Only microbes were there on the bare land without any vegetation. There wasn't any global feedback, which means these microbes couldn't yet affect Earth, its atmosphere, or other systems in any way. The second stage is the mature biosphere, which was 2.5 billion to 540 million years ago, when stable continents formed and the biosphere started to have a strong influence on the Earth. The third stage, known as immature technosphere, is where we are now with interlinked systems of communication, technology, transportation, electricity, and computers that draw resources from Earth's systems and affect the biosphere. The fourth stage, also known as the mature technosphere, is where Earth should aim to be in the future. It means technology will benefit the entire planet. We'll use sustainable forms of energy, like solar power. Planetary intelligence is the sign of a mature planet and researchers are trying to figure out how we can move towards it. So things we do on an individual level do matter. The collective activity of life, like microbes or plants, can change a planet and make it more than just a lifeless rock floating in space. Through the biosphere, our home planet kind of figured out how to host life by itself billions of years ago, and it's still going. Now we need to figure out how to have a similar kind of self-maintaining system, but this time with the technosphere. It's hard to imagine planets could generally become sentient, like Pandora, or some other imaginary conscious world out there. There are a few reasons for that. First, planets form based on how different materials like rocks, gases, and liquids gather around a new star. It's like you have a big family gathering, where everyone brings different ingredients to make a delicious dish. And just like how these ingredients won't suddenly turn into a living being, the materials that make up a planet won't just turn into self-aware creatures. On Earth, after billions of years of complex chemical reactions, some molecules started to replicate themselves and carry information. That's how life on our planet began. And Earth is the only such example we have. Here's the second reason. Imagine you have a big garden where you plant a lot of mushrooms or bacteria, hoping they'll become really smart and help you take care of the garden. But mushrooms and bacteria don't have brains like we do. Eh, it's not like they need it anyway. Having a big brain is really expensive for animals too. 
It takes a lot of energy to keep it running. So, animals only become as smart as they need to be to survive and thrive in their environment. Dogs and cats are pretty smart because they need to be able to avoid danger and find food. They don't need human kind of intelligence for things like building houses, creating art, or inventing new technologies. So, it would be hard to bring all living beings and plants to the same level of intelligence. The third reason why it would be difficult for a planet to become sentient is the main rule of the animal kingdom. Life is all about survival of the fittest. Every creature is competing for resources, like water, food, and space. But not only do different species compete against each other, but individuals within the same species also fight. Just think of how fiddler crabs fight for territory on the beach, or how wolf packs fight over prey. Or me, when I see an empty spot on a crowded beach. This kind of competition is not a good base for global cooperation. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, ants. They may not be the brightest creatures on the planet, but when they come together in colonies, they can achieve amazing things, like gathering food that's way bigger than them, building nests, raising young, and even farming. In fact, they act like a super organism, called a hive mind, where every ant works together towards a common goal. Insects like bees and ants are very altruistic and work together to ensure their queen reproduces. If one large ant colony took over our whole planet, it could act as a single mind and work towards the colony's and planet's interests until they run out of resources. But in reality, it's hard to imagine any organism, even a superorganism, could reach such a level of self-awareness and consciousness. Number 5. How could we keep in contact? When it comes to communication, ants use pheromones and humans use nerves. Both of these methods work well for small organisms, but when it comes to a giant planet-sized entity, it would be hard to make such communication fast and efficient. So, communication within a planet-sized entity would be much slower than what we have in our homes, like our computers or smartphones. Oh well, we'll just continue dreaming about Pandora. 2022 and 2023 have been landmark years for discovering new, fascinating worlds. Last year, NASA surpassed 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. The list is incredibly diverse. It includes rocky super-Earths, gas giants like Jupiter, ice giants like Neptune, and so on. And this is just the beginning. There might be more than a trillion exoplanets in our galaxy alone. But the most important question is, how many of them are habitable, you know, for us? Are there any planets on this list that could have life on them? Or that could be a future home for us? Of course there are. And in 2022-2023, we found as many as five of them. So buckle up and hang on for a wild ride beyond our solar system. The first planet on our list is Wolf 1069b, a boring and stodgy designation. So I'll simply nickname it Wolfie, because hey, who's gonna stop me, NASA? <laughs> a new study conducted by 50 starry-eyed astronomers confirmed something awesome. This exoplanet, Wolfie, which is located just 31 light-years away from us, could potentially be a rocky world. In other words, theoretically, it's a habitable planet. The team behind this discovery used a technique called radial velocity to detect the exoplanet. This is a way scientists study the movements of stars and planets. It's as if when you're playing catch with a friend, as they throw the ball to you, you can see it coming closer and closer. It's kind of like radial velocity. When a planet is moving towards us, it makes the star it orbits appear to be coming closer to us. When the planet is moving away from us, it also makes the star look more distant. Scientists can use this information to figure out what the planet is doing and how big it is. And that's how they found Wolfie. This exoplanet is estimated to be the Earth's size and about one and a third times the mass of our planet. It's orbiting a red dwarf star who I'll call Wolfie's mama. But here's the real kicker. Wolfie orbits within its star's habitable zone, which means it's a prime candidate for liquid water to exist on its surface. That's like hitting the exoplanetary jackpot. Ooh, wish I had a ticket. The study estimates that if Wolfie does have an Earth-like atmosphere, 
temperatures could rise as high as 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which would mean liquid water could pool on the planet's day side. But here's the catch. The exoplanet is tidally locked to its star, meaning that the same side always faces the star. Just imagine, one side of the planet is always basked in the warmth of its star, while the other is in eternal darkness. Like middle school. <laughs> Just kidding. The team behind the discovery believes it's a prime candidate for further studies. But we'll probably have to wait another 10 years for answers. Until then, we'll just have to keep searching the skies with our telescopes and crossed fingers. Our next planet is TOI 700e. Hmm, what's a good nickname? NASA has just discovered a new planet that's set to take the galaxies by storm, or shall we say by orbit. I'll nickname it Toys Were Us. It's almost the size of Earth, most likely has liquid water on its surface, and it's only 100 light years away. We're not talking about a road trip, of course, but this is close enough in the grand scheme of things. Toys Were Us is the fourth planet in its system, and it's got a bit of a short orbit, just 28 days to circle its star. Well, at least you would have a birthday every month. <laughs> Hooray! This time, the discovery was made using the transit method. Planets themselves are incredibly small and hard to detect. But when a planet is in front of its star, it blocks some of the light coming from it, making it look a little bit dimmer. As soon as the planet moves away, the star gets brighter again. So, to find the planet, scientists watch very carefully to see if the star's brightness changes. If it does, that means there's probably a planet playing hide-and-seek with us. And that's how they discovered Toys Were Us. The test mission discovered it. It discovered 66 new exoplanets and 2,100 more candidates waiting to be confirmed. TESS has been very busy creating imaging for 75% of the sky. Talk about efficiency! Toys Were Us is located in the optimistic habitable zone, between planets C and D, but it may be tidally locked, just like Wolfie, so we might have to settle for a one-sided water world. The discovery of Toys Were Us is a promising prospect for future follow-up observations, and it demonstrates the potential for TESS to find even smaller exoplanets in the future. Who knows? It may find a new home for humanity among the stars one day. Or at least, a new vacation spot. Next, we have twins GJ1002b and GJ1002c. The galaxy just got a little bit closer to us with the discovery of two exoplanets, which I'll nickname Hansel and Gretel, that are just a stone's throw away from our solar system. That's right, these two Earth-like planets are located less than 16 light-years away, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump in space terms. For comparison, Proxima Centauri b is the closest Earth-mass exoplanet at 4.2 light-years away. So, these two new neighbors are among the closest to us. They both orbit a red dwarf star with barely one-eighth the mass of the Sun. It's quite cool and faint, but that's okay, since both planets are very close to it. Hansel takes 10 days to orbit its star, while Gretel takes just over 21 days. Even more birthdays, I guess. The discovery was made by an international scientific team and was no small feat. The team had to work together with two instruments, Espresso and Carminis. The result? A cafe latte. Nah. What they got were measurements so accurate, you could practically count the number of craters on the planet's surfaces. The big deal is, the planets are located in the habitable zone of their star and are just the right size, making them excellent candidates for future atmospheric studies. The lead author says, Nature seems bent on showing us that Earth-like planets are very common. With these two, we now know seven in planetary systems quite near to the Sun. Who knew our neighbors could be so friendly? In conclusion, the discovery of Hansel and Gretel is a giant leap for humankind. So let's all raise a glass of H2O, or whatever they drink on exoplanets, and celebrate it! The last planet on our list is LP890-9C, which I'll call Bob. This super-Earth located about 98 light-years away, is roughly 40% larger than our home planet. Moreover, it has a twin, which I'll nickname Ray, which is up to 75% larger than Earth. More space is always good, right? The two planets orbit around the red dwarf star. 
Unfortunately, Ray is quite hot to the touch, with an estimated temperature of 253 degrees Fahrenheit, so don't touch. Its sibling, Bob, is located in the habitable zone of its star, making it a prime candidate for the potential of life. But let's remember that the actual temperature of the planets depends on their atmospheres. It's possible that Bob, being the outermost planet, has a runaway greenhouse effect, making it more like Venus than Earth. So it might be too hot to be habitable at all. But let's not lose hope yet. The James Webb Space Telescope, launched in December 2021, is on the case. With its cutting-edge technology and powerful instruments, including spectrographs, it can peer into the atmospheres of exoplanets and reveal which ones might be habitable. So let's see what it discovers. This planet has been listed as the second most favorable habitable zone terrestrial planet. Now it's on the list with seven other Earth-like planets, all about 40 light-years away from us. Maybe they'll become our new homes in the future. Maybe we should fix the home we have. But until then, enjoy this moment and celebrate all of these new discoveries. Who knows how many more planets we'll find in the future, considering how much technology develops each year. Thousands? Millions? Meanwhile, Bob and Ray, Hansel and Gretel, Toys Were Us, Wolfie and her mama will all be out there waiting for us. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.